Yellowstone Nail Park. It has been called a cathedral to Mother Nature. It's no secret how it earned that title. But that's not all there is to this chunk of wilderness. Somewhere off the beaten path. If you want to get there, you better bushwhack. Beneath the surface, Never had any idea that we were going to be involved in anything so wild as this. This area looked like the bottom of your barbecue grill. There are places that few people ever see. You have to know where you're walking or else it could be a big, big mistake. And behind the scenes of what once was. Hidden underneath this tarpaulin right here. That is where you'll find Hidden Yellowstone. that traverses around Yellowstone is called the Grand Loop Road. The Grand Loop Road is about 142 miles long. Along every single mile of it, there's something hidden somewhere. And it's all there if you just go looking for it. Look around here. It's beautiful. Only 2% of the park has roads or buildings or anything. It's 98% of the park left of sheer, utter wilderness. Perhaps more than anything else, people come to Yellowstone to see its world-class collection of geysers. Some geysers have been known to spew thousands of gallons of water with little warning. This makes them extremely difficult to explore. However, there are some enthusiasts found almost exclusively at Yellowstone who know more about these natural beauties than anyone else. One of them is official park volunteer Mike Keller. Mike is a geyser gazer. Geyser gazing is a language unto itself, and we have all kinds of different terms from sput, which means an uh, insignificant little geyser, to splooge, to splash. I mean, there's all kinds of descriptive terms that we use for the activity of the geysers here in Yellowstone. Just understanding this vocabulary requires a lot of watching, something Mike has been doing for the last 16 years. I really couldn't say what actually got me hooked on them. I just started watching geysers, and I was fascinated by them. The way they erupt, the way they can change their activity, their inner relationship with one another. I mean, one year you can have a geyser that's wonderfully active, frequent, powerful. The next year, all of a sudden, it's dormant, and a feature nearby is erupting. You could very carefully walk out there if you knew your way, but as you know, it's very dangerous if you were to do that. So, no, not at all. Mike knows how to navigate this volatile terrain. It erupts all the time except for when fountain guys right over here erupts. It stops right at the end of fountain's eruption. It'll stop for about two or three minutes and then it comes right back on again. And then does that the rest of the day for you. As an official volunteer, he's been trained to do something visitors cannot. Excuse me, folks. Step off the boardwalk and observe geysers like the Kaleidoscope Group from an intimate perspective. To record his journey, Mike is armed with a handheld camcorder. Even with his years of experience, Mike has a healthy respect for thermal areas. It's scary. I mean, I always think about it every step I'm taking. It's like, is this safe? Am I going in the right place, etc. I mean, my biggest phobia by far is falling through into, a, into boiling water. Uh, that's, there's a lot of unpleasant ways to go, and so as far as I'm concerned, that tops the list. That is not a way I would want to end my life. The area where Mike is epitomizes one thing common to most thermal features, change. This is the kind of example of where you have to know where you're walking or else it could be a big, big mistake. Thin crust, boiling water. As I pan over here to the right, Kaleidoscope Geyser is the crater that you kind of see here in the foreground. Let me zoom in on that. Mike maintains a safe distance because the water it spews can burn flesh. 
This is the geyser the entire group was named after. I believe this geyser was called Kaleidoscope in the 30s because of the colors in the basin around it. It's nice to get a chance to be up close to some of these geysers that you normally don't have access to. While waiting for the eruption, Mike introduces the other members of Kaleidoscope's group. The spring you're looking at now is called Collapse Geyser. It was called Collapse because before 1989, this was a solid sheet of ground that suddenly collapsed and this geyser broke out. This is the basin of Deep Blue Geyser. This is the geyser that thumps very strongly when it erupts. What happens is you can see the center part of the pool where it's blue. The steam bubbles rise towards the surface and just before they can make it, they collapse because the water on the surface is too cool. So the ground around here thumps as a result. It's like a depth charge going off in the water. Kaleidoscope Geyser. The activity out here is fascinating. Over the last 11 years, it's been the best ever in the history of Yellowstone in the last since 1870. While Mike explores the unpredictable, most people come to Yellowstone for one of its most predictable features, Old Faithful. Despite its timeliness, keeping track of the geyser schedule isn't as easy as it would seem. Behind the scenes, rangers post the predictions so visitors know when to show up. The rangers are the keepers of the formula used to determine its schedule. This is 724 Victor, and it's all faithful prediction of 309 309. From here, they observe each eruption to calculate the time for the next one. How we actually time it is we begin it at the exact moment that we see water that lasts for more than two seconds. So that's when we press start on our stopwatch and we keep it going the entire time until we see absolutely no water again. And that's hard to do because there's a lot of steam, especially when it's cool. There's a lot of steam that mixes with the water and it can be really hard to get an exact end of the eruption. Then, depending on the length of the eruption, they add a specific interval of time. Right now, that interval averages around 85 minutes. And it's plus or minus 10 minutes, so okay. you gotta give us that minus. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> There's times when we get the prediction wrong. We get it right, we like to say we get it right about 90% of the time. So there's times when visitors are, are here, they say it's broke, it's never going to work again, or it's not as faithful as it was in the past. And that's just not true. It's just that it's a natural occurrence, and sometimes it might be longer between eruptions. While they can predict its activity, there is still a lot that is not understood about Old Faithful. To gain a better understanding of this natural occurrence, one group of scientists decided to go where no one had ever gone before, down the throat of the geyser with a camera. Geologist Jim Westfall guides the journey. And here we go, down the vent. And you can see it's still a slot uh, down as far as we can see so far. It's really quite a narrow slot, just a few inches wide. You also see occasionally drops of water falling down. Uh, you'll see those as we go along. Uh, that's uh, water that's condensing from the steam in the vent on our cool housing. Uh, those drops are very convenient, actually, because they tell us which way straight down, which we otherwise wouldn't know. One of their goals is to examine the shape of the current vent. The geyser had several other vents which have since closed up. The current one is more heavily contoured than expected. And now you can see we seem to be coming to kind of a shelf-like structure, and uh, we worry about whether we're going to land on that and not get off of it. And we bang into the surface of it and kind of uh, bang up and down a little, and aha, we go over the edge, which is very nice. Another bumpy ride, and they arrive at a chamber filled with water. It is 425 degrees Fahrenheit, far greater than the temperature at which water normally becomes steam. The pressure at this depth keeps it in its liquid state. Looks like a tornado now and again as it twists the camera, spins the camera around on the end of its cable. We really became very concerned whether our cameras could survive all of this. It certainly wasn't made with that in mind. 
never had any idea that we were going to be involved in anything so wild as this. They are about six stories down into the throat of Old Faithful when they can go no further. The journey shows one thing. A constriction about a third of the way down could one day choke the world's most famous geyser. In the absence of another vent, Old Faithful may stop working. Coming up, hidden away from public view are remnants of Yellowstone's past. This veteran tour guide knows just where to find them. Is an Abbott and Downing Yellowstone stagecoach. In the early days, visitors could get much closer to the thermal pools. They were even invited to drop things in, a practice that is unheard of today. One feature earned the nickname Devil's Laundry. There, visitors put dirty handkerchiefs in to see them get sucked down and then spit out clean and white. Eventually, they clogged up the vent. Today, the park keeps visitors at a safe distance through a system of boardwalks. But that doesn't keep people from throwing things in. To keep the springs running smoothly, Mike also acts as a sort of thermal plumber. Coins mainly, those are the number one thing that people throw in the hot springs and the geysers. We definitely have some stuff in here that we need to get out, so. Our high tech equipment here, gloves to keep from burning our hands, a long metal pole, and a spoon. Pretty simple stuff. Back down we go. If they're allowed to sit in the feature long enough, they actually adhere to the wall or the sides of the pool. If you get enough of them in the hot spring, that'll start affecting the circulation within the hot spring. And then if the water doesn't circulate, you change the temperature of the water, changes the activity of the feature, you can actually clog them up and destroy them. Very small circles of nature are not very common in hot springs in Yellowstone. So that's generally how you can identify the coins and the features. You just look for the circles. And then when you see one, you go get it. One Yellowstone penny. I got pretty good skills over the years of retrieving things. You learn over the years. I mean, it's, it's you know, weight on the back of the pole and stuff like that. One U.S. small cent. Removing trash is critical to keeping the colors of the pools vibrant. That colorful display is just one reason that visitors will come back to this area again and again. One of the most hidden things about Yellowstone is its past. The park was once a playground for the very well-to-do. Visitors traveled around it was as much a part of the experience as seeing the park itself. However, to find what remains requires the help of veteran tour guide Leslie Quinn. He is intimately familiar with Yellowstone's past, especially this hidden collection of antique vehicles. This is touring car number 352, and it's my favorite of all the park's antique touring cars. Cruises down the highway at about 30 miles an hour, perhaps 35, and the entire way, you'd almost think you were riding in a dream. Being an old car, you might expect that if you wanted to get the door to shut tightly, you'd have to slam it pretty hard, but on a Model 614, this is how hard you need to slam the door. Just a beautiful, beautiful ride. At a time when few owned a personal vehicle, cars like these were a luxurious way to go. Everything about them was designed to enhance the park experience. Hidden underneath this tarpaulin right here is an Abbott and Downing Yellowstone stagecoach of a particular variety that used to be here called a tally-ho coach. The small seat up here was where the driver sat and this lever which was placed perfectly for the driver's foot was the one brake that he attempted to stop the coach with often packed to capacity the rattling wooden cars drawn by six horses demanded skill to control 
These coaches here in Yellowstone were also referred to as Yellowstone wagons because what made them distinctive was the fact that the seats faced forward. In most stagecoaches of the day, the seats faced inward so that the, those riding could converse with one another. But in Yellowstone, the idea was to sightsee the park. So all the seats faced forward so that everyone had a very nice view of where they were headed. There is a step here on the side, which looks a long way from the ground, but folks didn't step on this step from the ground. You merely just stepped across to get in the coach. The ladies were in long dresses, the gentlemen in all their finery, and they didn't want to have to climb up from the ground. The seat that hung off the back of the coach was referred to as the tally ho seat. Those who were going along the park roads would be outside and would see other stagecoaches passing in the other direction with folks sitting in the back. And they would wave and yell, tally ho, which is where the seat got its name and the whole aura of the tally ho coach comes from. This old western could have been ripped from the pages of Yellowstone history. Back when everyone traveled in a stagecoach, a rollicking ride was as much a part of the fun as sightseeing. On August 24, 1908, the drivers of a string of 17 coaches didn't have to create the drama. been called the greatest stagecoach heist in the 20th century occurred on this overgrown road between Old Faithful and West Thumb. Back in the stagecoach era, a highwayman realizing an opportunity on the one-way road that stagecoaches couldn't turn around on hid near Turtle Rock as the cavalryman who led the parade of 25 stagecoaches came up. He allowed the first eight stagecoaches to pass and then stood out when the ninth arrived and ordered them to stop. This is a holdout. Oh, put down that rifle. Stay inside or you'll get hurt. The stagecoaches were trapped. There was no backing up and no turning around. Now get moving. Get him! Help! Help! He got away with more than $2,000 worth of cash and jewelry. He was never caught and his identity remains one of Yellowstone's enduring mysteries. Scattered around Yellowstone's back country are more than 200 waterfalls that have never been seen before. This waterfall hunter takes us off trail to find one of the biggest. At the end of the West Thumb Stagecoach Road lies buried treasure. It's in Yellowstone Lake, the biggest North American mountain lake. But getting to the treasure is a challenge. The water is a bone-chilling 41 degrees. It's not uh, what you'd call warm, tropical, easy diving. When that water hits your face, it's like uh, being stung by a bunch of bees. For professional diver John Brooks, it's worth it. You, you quickly forget the pain, though, uh, when it's drowned out by the sense of excitement for what you might be finding. Yeah, it's uh, 51 feet right here. I think the lake has many uh, secrets that, uh, without you know, sticking your head under the water, nobody will ever know what's what's truly there. Because the lake has always been a popular destination, the divers figured there had to be historical relics lying on the bottom. Until this special filming mission, no one knew exactly what was there or where to find it. What has long since disappeared from the surface lives on underwater. A stagecoach wheel turned up near where the dock at the end of the road once stood. It um, had, had either fallen into the lake or been abandoned in the lake um, during that time. A string of rowboats lies on the bottom not far from the pier they had been tied to. The cold 
fresh water, of course, the wood is well preserved, and so the boats look just like they did when they were put there. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun to swim down through this graveyard of old uh, lake rowboats. On an island in the middle of the lake sits Yellowstone's answer to the Titanic. The remains of a steamer called the SS EC Waters. Well, as you swim out over uh, this, you, you get a feel for the size of this ship. Built in the same era as the ill-fated ocean liner, passengers were packed in without much consideration for safety. Just like the Titanic, it was ice that forced it to its final resting place on the island. Fortunately, in this story, no one was on board when the steamer met its demise. The bottom of the lake holds another secret, active thermal features. Because of the gases being released, the water looks like champagne. An eruption down here looks much different from one above ground. When that uh, boiling hot gaseous water hits uh, the water of Yellowstone Lake, which is in the low 40s, uh, it creates an effect uh, much like a mirage that you see in the desert. get cold and really cold in this 41 degree water you can swim over by a thermal vent and it's like stepping into a sauna it, uh, it warms you right up with the extreme cold and daunting depths perhaps only professional divers will ever find out what other secrets the lake holds There's a reason much of Yellowstone is hidden to this day. It's vast backcountry. This harsh and varied terrain was carved by volcanoes more than a half million years ago. Even for a lifelong explorer, navigating Yellowstone's backcountry is treacherous. We had to scale a very soft sandy butte to get out we looked down and the Yellowstone River is right there and it's really really deep and really really swift and there is no beach if you fall down this steep sided butte and you're in the river it's just the end this was just one of the places Lee Mike Stevens and Paul Rubenstein went looking for hidden Yellowstone search of unknown waterfalls. Yellowstone is so big, it's rich with waterfalls no human has ever seen. After seven years, sometimes working from the sketchiest information, the team located over 200 waterfalls, mostly in Yellowstone's backcountry. Exploration of this magnitude is unheard of in current day Yellowstone. In most cases, the waterfalls are not visible from the air because they're either hidden in deep timber or hidden in deep canyons. The one Lee is going to today had never been documented until marks on a recent map piqued the team's interest. no other reports or sightings. They had to find it. It was just the kind of thing for a waterfall hunter. Boy, there's just nothing like the feeling of seeing a hundred foot waterfall that, you know, few or no people have ever seen before and that we know have never been written about. Using a biother peak in the northeast corner of the park as a landmark, Lee retraces his steps to the falls. Following the stream bed is usually a good way to find a waterfall. In this case, that wasn't the best way to go. This is an unnamed stream that we're on. In fact, it doesn't appear on many maps. 
you can see it's kind of difficult. In fact, we may be looking at scaling on up. Yeah, we're gonna have to scale on up. There are some people who think Yellowstone, parts of Yellowstone should remain hidden. We, we want some places that if you wanna get there, you better bushwhack. That's part of the charm. That's part of the adventure. Steepness of terrain is one way to predict a waterfall size. You know, the first time Mike Stevens and I came up here was, must have been 1996. And about the time we got to this boulder field, we were getting really excited because we thought the chances were really pretty good of, a, of finding a really big waterfall. The waterfalls are only three miles from the northeast entrance road. We're gonna have to go up this way. But without trails or other obvious markings, it may as well be 30. There's a reason why these things are not well known, these waterfalls. Right behind this rather big pine tree, you have to kind of skirt the edge over here. Just walk kind of carefully. And then we rounded the corner up ahead and we hit the falls and it was just kind of like magic. This is a big one. This is a hundred footer. While Lee and his team were the first to thoroughly document the waterfall, Lee suspects they probably weren't the first to see it. I wonder if a solitary fur trapper might have seen it in the 1830s, or of course a Native American, or perhaps one of the gold prospectors that frequented this area in the 1860s. Uh, so those are the, really the people I see in my head and wonder who got here, if anyone. The team calls it Enchantress Falls. Lee points out that these are the first moving images of this part of hidden Yellowstone, as far as he knows. Coming up, while Yellowstone's animals might appear docile enough for a petting zoo, they are still wild, a fact some visitors learn the hard way. In Yellowstone, nature is not on a leash. Witnessing the behavior of animals in the wild is a uniquely Yellowstone experience. Few other places in the country have such an array of wildlife. When a bear shows up near a road, it instantly attracts large numbers of people. The park refers to them as bear jams. Hundreds of vehicles can all of a sudden wind up strung all up and down the road with people moving out with cameras, binoculars, or whatever to watch the bear. And it, it gives the visiting public an opportunity to watch a bear doing what a bear does naturally, up close and personal. However, it is possible to get too close. Oh, yeah. There is one time of year when the chances for human-animal encounters increase. During August and September, lucky visitors get to witness the elk rut, a mating ritual that drives males to the point of frenzy. Anything that moves can fall prey to their hormonal outbursts. giving new meaning to the term road rage. Aside from the obvious roadside antics, there is another way to tell that the rut is in full swing. The clue is on this tree. To uh, have the privilege of mating with all the cow female elk uh, in the valley or in his harem, this is one of the ways that he does it. He basically uh, will rub the, the velvet off of his antlers and also kind of strengthening his, uh, his ability to go into battle. The bison is another Yellowstone inhabitant that is hardly hidden. However, the true nature of these prehistoric animals is a mystery even to the experts. A lot of people who uh, visit Yellowstone perceive bison to be very docile because of their stance in the fields and they look so peaceful there. 
However, uh, I have seen them, without any given notice, to immediately become aggressive and defend their territory, moving at speeds that you just cannot believe so quickly that a person could never get out of their way. No one knows what makes a bison decide to attack or to run away. The National Park Service uses this footage to warn visitors not to get too close. Most people mistakenly suspect the grizzly bear is responsible for the greatest number of deaths by wildlife in Yellowstone. It's actually the bison. Most of Yellowstone's three million plus annual visitors don't spend much time away from the main road. For an overnight stay, they head to its hotels. One of the most well known is the Old Faithful Inn. It is the forerunner of a style of architecture called parkitecture. Old Faithful Inn was built in the rustic style. When constructed in 1904, that was a revolutionary idea in national parks. By creating the building in the rustic style, that looked as if it had grown out of the landscape. Some of it did grow out of the landscape. The strangely shaped knotted wood came from a nearby forest. While its grandeur endures, the Old Faithful Inn has been altered over the years construction hides these changes. Comparing a picture from today to an old postcard reveals the most obvious difference in the front of the inn. People passing through and such, very busy place today. In 1904, that portion of the structure was not even inside. The front wall sat back further in those days, and that was the outside porch. The second floor veranda hasn't changed much except in fantasy. That old slide shows a beautiful deciduous forest growing all outside that was never there. As the modern slide shows, that veranda has always overlooked Old Faithful Geyser and it's always been relatively open outside it. There are other secrets found in the old series of postcards. Once the park had a far greater number of luxurious lodgings than it does today. When Yellowstone moved from stagecoaches to automobiles in 1917, the Norris Hotel and Lunch Station was no longer needed, so it never opened for the 1917 season. It stood on the bluff until 1927, when the structure was raised, so the picture today just shows us a small meadow. A similar fate befell the park's grandest structure ever, the Canyon Hotel. The old rumor said that it was a mile to walk around it. It had a beautiful entrance incline so that you could see and be seen as you strolled up to come into the hotel. In the alcove in the middle of the staircase is where the orchestra used to sit and play every evening. However, the site was never stable. The entire 50 years the Canyon Hotel stood there, it was sliding down the hill and twisting as it did so. The hotel was torn down. The site today, just a big open hillside meadow here in the park. For another of the Grand Hotels, more remains than just a clearing in the woods. The Fountain Hotel used to sit on the other side of the meadow over there. It opened in 1891 and was considered the park's finest in its day. It was the only one that offered a hot bath. Barely visible in the grass, there is still evidence of the pipe that once carried water from the nearby hot spring to the hotel. While the building no longer stands, the mystery surrounding what happened on this spot more than 100 years ago endures. The Grand Hotel used to stand right where we're walking through right now. I just passed over one piece of the foundation. I'm about to pass out the front wall. But on the night of July 30th, 1900, a gentleman by the name of El the dining room of the hotel stepped to the concierge desk and bought a cigar, stepped out to the front porch, 
lit the cigar, walked off into the nighttime, and vanished utterly. For 100 years, we have never known what became of Mr. Piper. Did he fall into a Yellowstone Park hot spring? There are several nearby that would fit the bill. Did he abscond with the funds from the bank, and this was where he chose to make his escape? For 100 years now, we have never known, and in all likelihood, it is a mystery that shall never be solved. People are perhaps most drawn to discover Yellowstone because it is constantly changing. The most obvious sign of change is fire. The fire in 1988 was the biggest blaze in recorded history. Fire for 360 degrees high. It was like nothing I had ever seen. If you would have told me in 1987 that we would have had a fire start on the west central boundary of the park and burn all the way across the park and go out the park on the north central boundary, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed you. But now, after experiencing it, um, I know that it is possible. The fire season started early that year. The flames raced through the forest, eating up 150,000 acres in one remarkable day. They even threatened the Grand Old Lodge. The nation's largest force of firefighting crews and machines was sent in to rescue the park from nature's wrath. One firefighter claimed that it looked as if hell itself had spilled over. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, just dark as it could be, like the dead of night, because of the, the smoke, and it was a sunny day. Despite the best efforts of humans, it took an act of nature, snow in mid-September, to finally staunch the flames. Afterwards, pictures like these made headlines. Now the question was, would Yellowstone recover? Now, while fire still scars the landscape, there's hope hidden in Yellowstone's most abundant tree. Tree expert and fire ecologist Roy Rankin picks through the ashes of Yellowstone's trees to uncover their future. The forest where he is walking has burned more than once. On the outside, this is obvious from the black charcoal covered in new growth. However, the inside reveals even more about how fire shapes this landscape. By sawing a wedge through here, I can count the annual rings on this live tissue to actually date back to the occurrence of this first fire event. The previous fire that burned in here first occurred in 1897, and we were able to find that out by counting the annual growth rings between the time that fire occurred in 1897 and then the 1988 fire event that killed the tree. This area would burn at least once during a 60-year period. For Yellowstone's most abundant tree, the lodgepole pine, fire is both a killer and the key to its survival. Lodgepole pine produces a cone that opens in response to heat generated from the fire. Um, the cones are retained in the crowns of the tree, and they can be retained there for 20, 40, 50 years, for decades. The whole purpose of those seeds is to be stored in the crown of the tree in the event of a fire passing beneath. After the fires of 88, 
Some experts suspected that in certain cases the park soil might not even support the naturally resilient lodgepole. Uh, right after the fires of 88, this area looked like the bottom of your barbecue grill. Dirt, ash, very black, no green whatsoever. And these trees are the result of the fire burning through and providing a heat source sufficient to open the cones that were stored up in the tree. The cones open, the seeds come down, so this, this flush all came about the first year following the fire. Even though regeneration was evident soon after the fire, it was still hard to imagine. The unfolding drama attracted people eager to see for themselves. Last year I ran into an elderly couple whose first experience to Yellowstone was in 1988 seeing it on, t on television. They had agreed that, you know, boy, it looked pretty bad at that point in time. Well, you know, as, when I ran into them last year, they had come back to, re to experience some of these areas that they had originally seen in 1988. And they looked out on the landscape and they said, now how did you guys plant all those trees out there? And I told them it was just physically and financially impossible for us to do so, but that uh, these trees came in on their own devices. And uh, um, they couldn't believe that. <laughs> that Mother Nature took care of, of that, that, that end of the job. There is little doubt that Yellowstone will always be a popular destination. It is a place where people have always come to discover something new, something different. Just the drive down to Yellowstone, for example. Left early in the morning, I saw lots of white-tailed deer and mule deer. To me, it's, it's, it's always a fresh, new experience, you know. Even without special expertise or access, you can still find hidden Yellowstone. It all depends on knowing where to look. It's kind of so far beyond the natural laws of your daily life that you almost feel you're in a, a different world. There's a tremendous amount of beauty around us, we just don't see it. And that's right there. It's there in the people we know, and it's there in nature. It's all over the place. Visitor Charles Paletti found his Yellowstone while photographing the colorful runoff of a hot spring with an old plate camera at a popular visitor stop. I just think there's a sort of a... Uh, an innate sort of thing in lots of folks that wants them to search out places of pristine beauty. Maybe we're trying to get away from the hassles of the outside world or something. There's something hidden somewhere. And it's all there if you just go looking for it. Look around you. It's beautiful. Only 2% of the park has roads or buildings or anything. It's 98% of the park left of sheer, utter wilderness. Perhaps more than anything else, people come to Yellowstone to see its world-class collection of geysers. Some geysers have been known to spew thousands of gallons of water with little warning. This makes them extremely difficult to explore. However, there are some enthusiasts found almost exclusively at Yellowstone who know more about these natural beauties than anyone else. One of them is official park volunteer Mike Keller. Mike is a geyser gazer. Geyser gazing is a language unto itself, and we have all kinds of different terms from sput, which means an uh, insignificant little geyser, to splooge, to splash. I mean, there's all kinds of descriptive terms that we use for the activity of the geysers here in Yellowstone. Just understanding this vocabulary requires a lot of watching, something Mike has been doing for the last 16 years. I really couldn't say what actually got me hooked on them. I just started watching geysers, and I was fascinated by them. The way they erupt, the way they can change their activity, their inner relationship with one another. I mean, one year you can have a geyser that's wonderfully active, frequent, powerful. The next year, all of a sudden, it's dormant, and a feature nearby is erupting.
Yellowstone Nail Park. It has been called a cathedral to Mother Nature. It's no secret how it earned that title. But that's not all there is to this chunk of wilderness. Somewhere off the beaten path. If you want to get there, you better bushwhack. You could very carefully walk out there if you knew your way, but as you know, it's very dangerous if you were to do that. So, no, not at all. Mike knows how to navigate this volatile terrain. It erupts all the time except for when fountain guys right over here erupts. It stops right at the end of fountain's eruption. It'll stop for about two or three minutes and then it comes right back on again. And then does that the rest of the day for you. As an official volunteer, he's been trained to do something visitors cannot. Excuse me, folks. Step off the boardwalk and observe geysers like the Kaleidoscope Group from an intimate perspective. To record his journey, Mike is armed with a handheld camcorder. Beneath the surface... Never had any idea that we were going to be involved in anything so wild as this. This area looked like the bottom of your barbecue grill. There are places that few people ever see. You have to know where you're walking or else it could be a big, big mistake. And behind the scenes of what once was. Hidden underneath this tarpaulin right here. That is where you'll find Hidden Yellowstone. that traverses around Yellowstone is called the Grand Loop Road. The Grand Loop Road is about 142 miles long. Along every single mile of it,